Welcome to SciTech Culture with Steve Kern and Ben Warner, where we examine science, technology, and culture in the 21st century. Visit our website at SciTechCulture.com. So Samsung's uh, come out with its uh, latest generation of uh, foldables, the uh, um, the Z Fold 3 and the Z Flip 3. We've spoken about the uh, the folding phones that they've uh, released in the yeah. past. Um they're a little nicer. They're a little sleeker. Maybe the colours are a bit more interesting, etc. But I don't know um, if it actually changes the concept and whether or not it's actually um, a usable form factor. It's more. It's still in a. I don't know if you think this is just more in a curiosity kind of. Oh, that's that's interesting. A nice try. Um, <laughs> but you know, when when you consider that. Um, you know the the flip is going for is going to go for like fifteen hundred bucks Australian and the fold for twenty five hundred. Um, you know I, it, it, who is it for other than early adopters or people with deep pockets or both at this point? I don't know, Ben. The only fold I want is on my uh, laptop, <laughs> and outside of that, you know, a fold is very nice, but is it necessary? Yeah, I don't think there's much to say. It's, look, it's great Samsung are pushing ahead with this innovation and, and look, every version is is getting better, but I just still don't know who needs or who even wants a folding phone. Unless they get to a stage where um, the actual thickness in its folded state is like roughly the equivalent of the thickness of a regular flagship smartphone now, otherwise... Um, you know, it's nice, yeah, that, you know, the flip, you can just go click mm-hmm. like that and it, you kind of get the old school flip experience with that and uh, but it's still quite thick, um, you know, in its folded yeah. state. So, um, other, and like I said, it just seems to be still in a novelty factor stage, for, but it's a very expensive novelty. <laughs> very, very much so. I, I mean, I guess the only thing I can say is that probably Samsung aren't that strong in the tablet department, certainly not mm. in Australia. So, that you know, for them it's probably, you know, going to kill two birds with one stone or, you know, maybe pull a few diehard Android tablet people, <laughs> you know, across to a Samsung uh, phone device. But otherwise I just, yeah, I don't see it. I don't feel it. I don't love it. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll, we'll we'll return to this in a, maybe a year's time when they release the uh, the fourth gen, see if they've made any improvements. But I would say make it thinner in its folded state and half yeah. the price and then you might have uh, something going there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's still a long way off. Yeah, absolutely. All right, um, we'll return to our rolling coverage of um, of the pandemic and uh, COVID, etc. And uh, obviously, just going strength to strength here in um, Australia. So there was the big. Uh, I don't know if you'd call it a shock. I guess it was inevitable, really. You know, the nation's capital, Canberra, and the Australian yeah. Capital Territory went into a seven day lockdown with um, cases reported there. Um, and yeah, again, I, I think there was a feeling of inevitability with with this, given you know the ACT is not in the middle of New South Wales, but you know the idea is there. It's so it's only you know Canberra's only three hundred kilometres roughly mm-hmm. from Sydney, uh, where um, you know where everything's happening. And um, what sort of stuck out at me was that you know Canberra and the ACT haven't effectively had um, any cases uh, since probably that initial outbreak last year, and. Um, I think it was kind of a wake-up call for them because uh, you know they um, you saw all the classic signs again: the panic buying, the rushing, you know, to, to get 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 themselves locked down and all that sort of thing. And um, maybe you know you don't want to wish you know bad health comes on people, but um, in some ways it's a little bit of a um, like anywhere really um, that hasn't been touched. Like the, uh, the Northern Territory saw this recently as well, where they'd never experienced these ca- like Delta cases, etc. Or whatever cases that were there and um it kind of um you know reminded everyone that you know they too can be touched by it too yeah well i think uh for australia now covid's getting serious and uh it's not the covid it was last year this is the delta strain it's sort of changing the dynamics and uh it's showing that uh when you've got a really infectious strain it's really hard to keep out and i think we're seeing now across the country uh you know 
we're seeing the country and, and the states individually wrestle with it. And I think, uh, you know, further outbreaks this year are just, just not out of the question. Yeah, and I think that's also tied with the fact that, you know, our vaccination rate's been quite slow. So um, that's sort of like the double whammy with this because, um, you know, uh, given that Australia was uh, undertaking a suppression um, strategy yeah. with the virus that um, in fa- in the face of low vaccination numbers, the only option left over was lockdowns. And, you know, effectively, you know, um, Queensland isn't in lockdown anymore, but, you know, effectively they, they only had a lockdown recently too. So you're talking you know, potentially more than half the country now being affected by this. Um, so, yeah, like you said, it is getting serious. Well, yeah, and as one state comes out of lockdown, it's just as likely that another one will go in. Um, and that's what we've seen over the last month. Yeah. You know, South Australia go in, come out, Queensland in and out. Victoria, surprisingly, like still locked down or locked down again. Yeah. It's uh, And New South Wales really wrestling with with a caseload that's starting to build up now. And I think, you know, suppression worked for us really well last year when, you know, it wasn't Delta, you know. And I think uh, when you've got a really infectious strain, I think all of us now are coming to appreciate that uh, we need to get vaccinated. We need to get vaccinated as soon as we can with whatever we can get a hold of and um, that we've still got a long way to go because even getting to 80%, will, I think, uh, bring a lot of questions about how we open up even then because you're still looking at least, you know, two, three million people nationally who who would be eligible unvaccinated and that, you know, that's going to have a health impact as well. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, the possibilities of opening up, I'm, I'm sure that that's on, the, on everyone's mind, you know, what's the, the end goal. But I guess um, the uh, one way we can look at it is to have a look at uh, what New Zealand is um, looking at doing. Um, they've recently come out and announced a couple of things in terms of their approach to um, the border strategy, etc. cetera. Um, and they're taking a, what they're calling a risk, individual risk-based model, which is effectively that um, for the first uh, quarter of next year, they would establish low, medium and high risk pathways into the country. And I guess that depends on whether the country you're coming from is low risk, medium risk or high risk. And then that will determine mm-hmm. how you would enter the country. So the idea being low risk is probably you'll just be able to go straight in. Um, medium risk might require some time of home quarantine and uh, high risk is probably um full like either hotel quarantine or some sort of um, quarantine at a um, dedicated facility um, that the government um, is going to put in place Um, and it's interesting we we can probably i would imagine that we'd be looking to them to see how that strategy goes because um given how things have been going here the potential is is that that strat- we will probably b- be behind them in, in terms of the timing, um, in terms of um, mm-hmm. opening up, etc. Um, so it would be interesting to see um, how they go um, and uh, how that potentially might inform what happens here. Because I can't imagine that they, you know, Australia wouldn't be looking at it um, at what they're doing and uh, not paying attention and seeing if any of it works. Yeah, look, uh, you know, I hope New Zealand provide a template. For Australia, you know, and and we can follow it, but you know, I'm I'm even beginning to wonder anymore, you know, how how well we can follow these templates. We we follow the UK, you know, what what's happened in the UK very closely. The UK is a different dynamic to Australia, and so is New Zealand ultimately. So you but you would hope, but New Zealand have got such fewer numbers of people to vaccinate. Uh, you know, probably their international travel or, or you know, dynamic is, is different again from Australia. Uh, so there's so many additional factors in this that really, you know, will determine whether or not we can follow them successfully. So you, you would hope we can, but, you know, if perhaps there'll be a different uptake of the vaccine in New Zealand to Australia. You know, what does that mean? You know, the fact that they can rank their international arrivals on a whole, you know, series of metrics, would that apply in Australia? And and what would the, would the risk ranking be the same? So there's still so much 
I mean, I'm not saying we couldn't learn and and certainly you'd you'd want to work together with New Zealand to try and find a successful outcome. But um, I'm not sure that with with a virus you can you can just look at one situation and say it would apply elsewhere because the virus just will use any means it can to uh, to get in and yeah. get around. And I guess in the Australian context, that seems like a long way off at this point uh, yeah, <laughs> um, before, well, yeah. before, before we even get to that point. Um, I guess just finally, um, just wanted to have a look at, um, I think we've spoken about uh, long COVID before, um, but specifically uh, there was an article I was reading about, um, you know, some, you know, looking at uh, what COVID, how COVID-19 affects the brain in the long term. Um, and, that you know, it's still sort of early days in terms of, you um, collating evidence and, um, you know, doing studies and trials or whatever of um, patients that have had it. And it's also hard to determine exactly what the causes are because, you know, there could be a whole lot of other things that are causing it, Um, you know, things like uh, nerve pain, fatigue, brain fog, um, you know, some of these classic symptoms um, could be the result of something else um, that's going on and uh, it requires like a longer term look at um, over many years probably of and many different types of people to determine the cause. But there was an interesting link that was made there that mm-hmm. um, in autopsies that um, virus fragments or the virus wasn't necessarily found in um, brain tissue itself, um, but there was um, a lot of inflammation um, and the suggestion being that although the virus itself didn't attack um, brain cells, the fact that it caused such a strong um, uh, inflammatory response, which then that happened in the brain, that that's potentially a cause for this kind of long-term COVID effect, like one of its symptoms. That's right. Now, you know, inflammatory response is actually your own immune system fighting COVID. uh, And if that doesn't shut off, or if it extends to, to various organs, then you, you get these inflammation. And we, we know for a fact that inflammation causes a lot of a, a lot of the sort of diseases that w- we see quite normally. So, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done around what the effects and, and what the longer-term effects of, of COVID are. And um, that's one of the reasons we need to be mindful of uh, the danger of it. So just because you're asymptomatic or not particularly badly affected or you think you're young, uh, that, uh, you know, it doesn't apply to you, well, it could. And if it does, the, the effects are serious. So once again, it's just another argument to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Mm. The two things are just to pick up on there is that, um, you know, the the idea is that um, even, even people who've had mild, only mild or minimal symptoms yep. have experienced this sort of long COVID. Um, That's right. Th- this long COVID issue, <clears throat> again, like you said, to take it more seriously. But the other thing, just more broadly, is that it's um, quite an odd um I guess dynamic going on where um, you know the virus doesn't seem to have this like a you know a, a blanket same similar impact uh, for everyone um, you know there are different um, impacts for different people um, you know someone who's totally asymptomatic how do we know that they don't have some sort of impact 20 years down the track um, or someone who was um, right. uber sick when they uh, first caught the virus and then it's fine for them afterwards um, like they have completely responded and then you've got examples of this long COVID thing and um, I think uh, you know I guess given enough time and I'm sure that there'll be plenty of people studying this for uh, for many years to come uh, in terms of um, impacts and uh, what causes what. Um, but a lot of it's going to be really interesting to read um, if they can determine like the causes of some of these and why some people are affected in certain ways and some people are affected in other ways. Well, yeah, and look, I think the, the reality here is that COVID's here to stay now uh, in one form or another form and the effects will go on for years now, both uh, in terms of the the pandemic, but also in terms of uh, our health. And, uh, you know, we'll be learning more about this and we'll be learning more how to live with COVID over the, over the next few years. So even if, if uh, you know, in Australia we do reach a Freedom Day, even if we do reach uh, a certain percentage of vaccinations, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we'll be done with this. So I think that's something that everyone just needs to be really mindful of. Mm, absolutely. All right, we might wrap it up there. Um, I guess we'll see where we're at uh, next week, whether or not 
<clears throat> you know, we're, we're still in lockdown in Victoria here. Um, you know, looking at it, uh, um, you know, I'd put an each way bet on it at the moment that it might just keep going. Um, they haven't been able to knock knock down the mystery cases and the, the cases infectious in the community as yet, which is kind of the bar that they've set at the moment um, uh, for here. But, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, like Victoria at the moment, despite, you know, all the wars that it's gone through with COVID is, uh, you know, having a, a, a much smaller outbreak than what's happening in uh, New South Wales at the moment. So, um, and yeah, how New South Wales fares over the coming months is really going to determine how things will go here uh, longer term. Yeah, I guess now we just have to wait and see and just hope everybody does their bit, get vaccinated as soon as possible. Absolutely. All right, so uh, don't forget our website, SciTechCulture.com. You can get all of our links and content there. You can subscribe to our YouTube and Vimeo channels, our RSS feeds, and watch us on any and all of your devices. And we greatly appreciate your visits to our website. All right, so that's it for this episode. We'll catch you next time.